Hello everyone, welcome to 1.5 Degrees, the podcast where together we explore the science, solutions, and stories involved in the fight against climate change. I'm your host, Heidi Pan, speaking with the professionals behind the latest research, policies, culture, and innovation shaping our response to global environmental challenges. For today's episode, we are incredibly honored to be joined by Nishad Shafi to discuss the role of science and policy and advocacy, empowering youth, and more. Nishad is an environmentalist and policy-oriented social change advocate, best known for his work on social and climate movements, environmental and climate policies in the Middle East, and his core area of expertise includes analyzing global environmental and climate politics, energy transition, and sustainable issues, and has been a prominent presence at international climate summits, especially UNFCCC Climate Summit, COPS since uh, 2015 on various capacities. He holds a master's degree in energy and environmental engineering and is based in Doha, Qatar. He was named in the Apolitical's list of the 100 most influential people in climate policy in 2019 and 2022, respectively, and Middle East Most Creative People 2023. Nishad is currently the co-founder and executive director at the Arab Youth Climate Movement Qatar, a first registered youth-led nonprofit association in the state of Qatar. He is a board member at Climate Action Network, Can Arab World, and Coalition Wild, UNESCO Youth Climate Action Network, UCAN, uh, and UNEP Youth Regional Facilitator for the Middle East. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nishad. It's truly an honor. Thank you. I hope that was not uh, the introduction was too big. No, uh, it's just you've done <laughs> so much. So, I mean, it's like, and there's even more that it like, probably hasn't been able to fit in that bio so um but yeah no, no. thank you thank you honored yeah. to be here yeah perfect yeah no i'm super excited for this conversation today um and i guess like i wanted to start by highlighting how you are a pioneer who i mean co-founded the arab youth climate movement qatar in 2015 i believe and since then i mean you've continued to do so much for the empowerment of arab youth and climate spaces <laughs> Um, I guess to start, could you tell us more about the work that you're currently involved with um, and how you came to be and are so passionate about this area? Well, I mean, it goes back to actually 2015 when we all started. Uh, the triggering moment was when um, I was in the university. There was um, obviously I'm coming from the background with science and my thesis was also on climate change. So I, I tell people I come to the activism with knowledge of climate science rather than an activist or mm -hmm. like elsewhere. So I come with a great knowledge uh, working in the climate sphere. And when in 2015, I got a chance to attend the COP21 in Paris, there was a triggering, uh, um, or you can say that was the epicenter where I realized there was a lack of uh, youth, especially mm -hmm. from the Arab world, uh, or at least represented. Uh, because when I try to tend to discuss sort of climate issues and what are youth role at that point of time at COP in Paris, uh, I found none to discuss. And it was like uh, members from the civil society, but are far elder to us, obviously, they are also necessary. But the whole concept of youth was not very particularly uh, common to this part of the world. And like I saw a lot of people from the global north, uh, you know, so it was a uh, the moment I realized that a region which is mostly impacted by climate change is underrepresented by the generation who will actually feel the burden of climate change. So that was a sort of um, moment, um, I would say, trigger for me to come back and really start the Arab Youth Climate Movement in Qatar. Even though we say we started in 2015, Arab Youth Climate Movement was a youth club because we were at university, and we then moved into a more legit organization only in 2018. Where, when we got registered as an association here in the state of Qatar. So um, the realization of underrepresentation of young people in the climate movement uh, back in those days, and also um, a quite uh, different scenario back, that climate change was not something a mainstream in the region because the conflict and other issues were on forefront in this part of the world. I'm talking about five years back, the whole youth climate movement came in 2017-18 obviously with whole greater Thunberg movement, but I think we as an organization was far before that. So we were in the sphere before the global movement started, but obviously the global North took over this, obviously the Van Wagen and they have been doing great work, mm -hmm. but uh, with a limited impact on our region. So at the moment we are working on how still young people from that region has to be represented, uh, how their views can be shared, 
um, at environmental issues, which are very critical for their countries and how to make sure that young people are part of the negotiations, part of the country's dialogue regionally, locally and globally. So that's the, my effort at the moment, working with Arab Youth Climate Moment. And we also have another initiative called Arab Youth for COP, basically helping young people to not only attend COP, but understanding what's negotiation, what's at stake for the country and the region in terms of climate negotiation. So very much involved at the moment with running programs with the Arab Youth Climate Moment here in Qatar. I'm also looking at uh, regional initiatives, which we are working at the moment. It's called Arab Youth for COP, and we're also developing a new platform for young Arab youth. Uh, this is a platform for anybody working in the climate space, young people between the age of 18 to 35, to showcase their uh, uh, efforts and initiatives and also have their uh, um, profiles. Like, uh, Heidi, you are one, somebody working on this uh, uh, podcast, it might have been very difficult to sometimes to identify actors from our part of the world against the rest. There you Google, you find everybody, social media actors and advocates. Here, many of the doers don't even have a social media account. Mm -hmm. So the platform is, which we are working at the moment is to give a space for those who are, for me in my terms, non-Googleable people who don't explicitly found on Google searches. So that's a platform we are currently working and hope to uh, take it live before COP28 or doing COP28 later in Dubai in November. That's really awesome. I mean, yeah, no, the issue of representation, I mean, I'm sure it was like, I didn't remember really much conversation about youth, like, you know, just a few years back even. And even still today, obviously, the movement is much more, you know, pronounced, um, which is really great. Um, and in terms of like the the issue of representation, it's so important in something that's like, you know, like a crisis that's truly affecting everyone and especially, you know, disproportionately impacting certain regions. So, I mean, you know, the work that you do is really inspiring um, on that front, yeah. Um, and I do wanna also touch on the fact that you mentioned you were a climate scientist turned climate activist. So I do wanna ask, I guess, what your thoughts are on bridging the gap between academia and policy work, because I mean, if we're talking on the aspect of representation and I guess like intersectionality, um, sometimes academia tends to be, you know, within itself and policy work is, it's it's not often that it utilizes, you know, science as much as it, as much as it should, so. Well, well, you rightly pointed out, I mean, um, when I started this uh, whole uh, climate literacy or education program, using the research I did part of my master's thesis, uh, which is mostly on the climate change uh, impacts on South Asia, but that was my study area. So I actually got the real glimpse of what's really happening. And we were running modelings to see what impact in 10 years or 100 years or 150 years would look like. Um, and uh, I, I mean, to be frank, like I said, it was a triggering moment for me all, but basically I understand the climate uh, the science dynamics. And the biggest gap was people from the academic always felt publishing papers and getting it published was something thriving. Obviously, in mm -hmm. the academic world, that's what you call achievement. But in the science of climate, you know, without having the backing of community understanding what exactly this research means to me or you, you are not going to succeed in making them understand. Because we're talking about CO2. Can we see CO2? It's not a commodity like, hey, you don't this, you lose. But that impacts of that CO2 uh, imply to many things like water, mm -hmm. like temperature raise. So you need to make people aware that this CO2 we are talking about uh, increasing on our uh, our atmosphere may cause the global warming, ultimately causing um, climate change, needs to do with your everyday issues. Until this is not conveyed to community, they will never believe. And like that's what most of the... Um, climate myth is all about yeah temperature has been always changing and what are you talking about so though the climate change mm -hmm. so they don't understand the trigger the pace and the impacts we're facing is staggering compared to a, a normal because we have studies doing that so getting people's acceptance of this science was critical i think a lot of climate scientists at the moment are turned to be an activist to use their science not only to publish but to bring onto a table where they can sit to a common person and talk to them what climate change look from a scientific point to what that means to a common man who don't understand science or anything. So I think for me, it gives me um, a lot of space because somebody who understood this at uh, the work at the university uh, who can sh share what I saw through my results, 
So when I'm trying to explain something to, um, for example, my parents or my community members, I used to tell examples. So during this study for the temperature variation of the years, we saw this. And when a normal patient should look like this. So those graphical stuff really make people do well. This is this is not normal change which we were expecting. So mm -hmm. that was through those um, scientific background, I could really bring people's understanding of climate in a more um, easy way rather than like, hey, climate is changing, we need to act. What do you act? Where do you act? So when you don't understand what is going wrong and what you have to be done in a very layman uh, language, community will never act. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. community has a role here. It is through community they push our governments and our corporates to do the, the reactions. But if they are not aware, obviously the, the corporates and governments will obviously misuse, you know, that sort of uh, non-understanding um, of community as a means to keep going as a business as usual. Mm -hmm. So it is very important how we take science from the labs. To the, for me, for climate scientists, it's mostly on the computer labs or modeling labs to mm -hmm. real-time data to showcase to the community that whatever we are talking about, this is how it looks in numbers and this is how it looks to your, your personal life. So unless you don't bring that emotional or human aspects of climate science, I think people would really don't like. And at the moment, this is happening in a very fast way. And that's why we see community acting in different parts of the world. So I think this is a, a better way to uh, talk to community because people understand science when it's spoken in layman's terms. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a really important point that you make in terms of like the accessibility of science and, you know, making sure that that gap is you know, bridged in an accessible way uh, is so important to, you know, getting people onto the, like, past the threshold of being able to get involved with this. I know in my personal experience, like, it was, I think I came across, like, a TED Talk. I can't really pinpoint, you know, when I started this, but I mean, I wouldn't have gotten involved in this, certainly if I hadn't, you know, been aware of this issue. And I mean, the, the aspect of climate education, it really needs to be built within the systems that, you know, like, like within our school education, like that needs to be a part of the conversation in order to spark, you know, change as fast as possible. So that's a, that's a really important point you make. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good point you mentioned, Haiti. The problem is our education system still lack that sort of bringing that curriculum about climate and environmental mm -hmm. issues. We have a pretty much very outdated uh, discussions about uh, environmental issue, which is, you know, don't use plastic, recycle, and that's ends up there. Mm -hmm. And that concept has not changed. I think this is somewhere where the um, some of the institutions in every country, I hear, I hear some of the countries have been doing, but for me, at least in our part of the world, it's not yet, where two of the two ministries, like Ministry of Environment and Climate, are working with the Ministry of Education to bring those modules to schools. Because in order to community to act, you need to bring this to the minds of the younger generation. They are the one who is going to be learning mm -hmm. faster. It takes for me a 30 minutes, one hour lecture in a school to, to talk about climate change to young people against one day to talk to my parents who really don't understand this concept in a very easy way. That's the difference between you know, the psychology of a young aspiring generation against somebody who have been heard about this, uh, the, the minimal information that they, they see on the media. But young people have been fastly approaching, reading, trying to understand their concepts, etc. So that's why it's very important that we target the education system. It would be very critical how we bring science of climate to educational systems in every country. And that would be really a game changer. No, for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, in and also, I guess, like bridging those intergenerational gaps, I guess, what are some things that you've learned um, that you think like everyone should be aware of? Well, I mean, th this is a very important thing. And intergenerational uh, discussions have been something we've been very keenly working in here in Qatar with Arab with Climate Movement uh, when we did an event, which was on, it was a tool we have, which is called a Carbon Footprint Tool. It's a project mm -hmm. asset we started in 2021. Uh, we developed the first of its kind carbon uh, measurement uh, application. And we uh, tend to take this to schools, to students, to measure their carbon footprint. So what we did was after a one month, of doing this sort of survey to know individual carbon footprint, we told the students from selected schools to come with the teachers and parents to our intergenerational workshop. So mm -hmm. what we tend to show is that we ask each student, like, what was your carbon footprint measured? Show us. And it showcases your carbon footprint from which aspects, from your food or from your daily expenses, daily travel, whatever it is. So when we were discussing this, we brought in parents like, hey, um, you had a life, obviously, we live in a very tropical, sunny countries. You know, our temperature normally hits 45, we thought it was, uh, you know, 
much impacts uh, our summers are looks like climate change mm-hmm. all the time plus with the climate change it is getting worse and worse mm-hmm. so we used to ask the parents like hey your generation how did you um survive because now the biggest survival of our part of the world is mostly air cooling systems which keeps us safe indoors but outdoors are super sunny and humid now at the moment we are hitting our summer, summer temperatures already 45 and this is just the beginning of our summer mm. so we used to ask our parents like there was time in this part of the world really didn't have air conditioning systems like my own parents and then they're only having like fans or little, little motor and fans and stuff so it was sort of an eye-opener for many of the young people who are born of this generation. They're like, you know, we have a sophisticated system to live and have a better life compared to uh, other unfortunate uh, people. But we compared how the parents see what the fortunes they had against their kids in this generation and try to bridge them, like, see, even though the resources was limited back in age, people were more... Um, um, environment conscious, like useless water, recycle, mm-hmm. never use plastic, compared to our generation who are not very into this because uh, they feel this is sort of uh, uh, things are um, part of their life because they are used to these things. Getting a plastic from a supermarket is quite used to because you've been doing that after after again and again. So I think the workshop was a huge eye-opener because we had almost 30 students and 30 parents attending. Mm. And we tried to tell each parents what they did in the past against their their new generation of kids doing. So even it was an eye-opening for kids to learn that their parents who had a, a different ecosystem or environment were more environmentally conscious than past who have been also watching for climate impacts and environmental issues, but we're far better doers than us. So it was a nice conversation. And we, we, we believe that this sort of uh, discussions really open up um, you know, larger community engagement when the parents understand, your grandparents understand to the students. So this will bridge the community, uh, what you call the communication gap between the generations. And also this will bring that some of the good practices we used to do in the past. So in our region, you know, conserving water was something very important considered because water was very precious because uh, we, we have lack of drinking water. Now, of course, we have desalinated water everywhere, but people are not conserving. They waste it. Mm-hmm. So the parents telling that, you know, we used to save in the, um, the park made up for mud because it stores for a long time and cleans the water automatically than the cleaners we have right now for water purification, etc. So it was a great learning lesson. And, and that sort of... Uh, Discussions are also important um, in any country and based on uh, wherever you are living, comparing your inter- uh, intergenerational and also not restricting to parents, but also going to change maker uh, to the to the government's employees from uh, decision making people. They how do they see or how do they perceive mm-hmm. these things are also very important. Yeah, no, I mean there's very different, like you know skill sets and knowledges and experiences based on like you know your your generation and so we need all of that you know in in the conversation and and in solutions for sure um and so you also you know you work in like MENA regions so I guess like I wanted to ask what are some underrepresented challenges that the global south and in particular middle east regions uh like Qatar are facing that everyone should also be more conscious of I mean, uh, the, one of the huge thing is um, when in terms of representation, we see very uh, minimalistic representation. I mean, uh, for many, of, for me personally, since 2016, 17 or 18, uh, until 2020, I should say, um, I would say until 2021, the, the Madrid COP. I mean, it was very few, including myself and a couple of people, are only the known climate advocates in the region. Obviously, we were fortunate even to get this sort of media attention and support for our work. But they tend to forget a mass number of people in some of the countries which are failed states, for example, in Yemen or Lebanon or Libya or Iraq, or Syria. This is the countries which are failed states, but they're all having the impacts of climate change which are worse than us because they don't have a uh, working government working on them or supporting them. Communities are um, um, going through worst impacts and recovering from the war and stuff. So a region which really need attention on climate have been uh, really underrepresented while some of the um, privileged youth of the North are uh, been advocating on their behalf. Uh, I said mm-hmm. this is an injustice way of doing because you are in a better place and better space and um, you get all the attention while um, your impact or influence is limited. I mean, they call climate influence sometimes. I really don't understand something what the influence against some of the underrepresented youth in our, our region. 
I always say some of the things I may say is through my experience. I lived in those countries or been to those countries. And like, I don't have the first hand experience other than getting that person on board and talking about those things. So this is what I feel the region lacks. If you, if you look at um, um, a Middle Eastern environment like this, you may find 10 against uh, 20 uh, influencers in the, in, the, in the global north. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that there are 200 of us here who are doing great work their community on the ground, supporting farmers, supporting families' livelih livelihoods uh, through sustainable practices. And um, they don't have, operate on uh, social medias but they don't showcase their uh, great work they're doing for the community on any uh, news network. So I think we, we we lack the media attention and it goes to, again, very few privileged ones in this region compared to larger media attention goes to a lot of Global North organization. And it is still happening. I wouldn't say uh, that, oh, this has changed. Young people from Arab region are represented. Again, the privileged Arab youth are represented. The, the larger number who are the great for me, I would say they are the on the ground doers are still underrepresented. And mm. the, the fact is, Heidi, they're the one who are really facing the day-to-day -day climate impacts we're talking about, because they feel it and they see on an everyday thing. Compared to obviously some of the activists in the global north tried to watch for them, which is which is important as well, but never felt you know first hand experience of the person who lived through mm -hmm. is the best example to tell the people what's the impact of climate change through them, and keeping in mind those countries has least to do with climate change, so this is the most part. I mean, some of the big uh, talkers and uh, youth advocacy are coming from the biggest emitters in the world. Mm -hmm. Again, some of the people in uh, Libya or Iraq or uh, in Yemen has nothing to do much to climate change, but they are suffering on the day-to-day -day things. So I think they need to be given bigger space. Media should interview them. Media should provide them the space to talk about the stories. Uh, so this also brings to you know the 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 past colonial or imperialistic issues where you know many of the countries might be British colonized or French colonized, but the French youth are advocating for the mm -hmm. French colonized countries while it's to be other way around. Those colonized countries should be talking about their issues, telling the colonizers to you know do some reparations for what happened in their past in their country. Mm -hmm. So it is. I think the, the the thing which is lacking in the in the climate movement, uh, it is not inclusive. Uh, even though at the moment uh, they say, yeah, we have somebody from the Arab region, somebody from Africa, right. but right. these are one or two representation. I mean, having Venisa from uh, Nigeria or having Nishad from uh, Qatar doesn't fill the the gap. I mean, against the ten is to one is to one is not a ratio. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. talking about the countries which are really impacting. So you need to take 10 countries which are really impacted by climate change against the one who are really the emitter. Why do the proportion goes? Emitter country has more people and they are not watching big impacts on their home country. They're talking for Africa and India or Jaya in Bangladesh rather than asking their own leaders to stop using fossil fuels. This doesn't happen. So they act as a global uh, environmental climate influences. Uh, I don't know what they really influence. They should influence mm -hmm. their own countries who need to act first. So I think there is a, a disagreement how the, the um, global youth movement at the, at the moment, uh, this has to change. Mm -hmm. And the change will only come when the, uh, obviously our youth from the, in the global north realize that they need to give more space for youth from other part of the world, especially from the less privileged, less developing nations to really show, show their stories, you know, which have uh, lasting impacts than the ones they have been privileged to live in. So I think uh, this disparity is also causing a bit of divide, how I as Nisha see a climate impact in our country to somebody in another country. So this this divide has to be reduced so that we all are collectively working as a youth movement globally. Yeah, no, I mean, I certainly agree with that. Like, People like, uh, I'll just take, for example, Greta Thunberg, she's most well known, like people like this, they're very important, but it tends, like, this is something I've noticed too, in these climate conversations, it tends to be an oversaturation of like, you know, privileged and perhaps not directly frontline impacted activists. And I mean, in that, again, people like Greta Thunberg are very important. And I'm going to borrow a phrase I've heard from uh, another activist that I really admire. Um, He, he said like, we need people like Greta Thunberg, but we cannot have five Greta Thunbergs, um, like just the same perspectives over and over again and prominent and, and so loud. And so, yeah, no, I mean, I'd also love to, you know, reach out to, to 
the any activists that you think would be you know love to share their story um, on the podcast um, that'd be really awesome um yeah and i i guess my my next question is um i mean for, for those who um want to get more involved in you know these global kind uh, like be it conferences or just you know general global conversations I mean, I went to recently my first, like it was kind of a local conference, but I mean, even those are really important, but I guess what advice, um, uh, you know, as someone who attends conferences frequently, um, do you have for uh, like having better uh, international conversations or getting involved with conversations? And I guess like, you know, conversational tips that you've picked up over the years, yeah. I mean, I, 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 always, I always keep telling that, you know, let's start very local. Like you mentioned, you started something local. That's important. You need to learn what's happening in your country. I mean, uh, sorry to say, many of the advocates in our part of the world are also getting with the same um, bandwagon of being an activist, cool stuff on uh, right, social right. media. So it's important to understand what's the climate change happening in your country, which are the uh, main areas of impacts your country, which communities are on the vulnerable part, how about the... Uh, uh, what's your country's response to that? What's your national uh, determined contribution, which is NDC submitted to your It talks about what's your country's plan to reduce your emissions. These are the things our young people also has to learn. I mean, for me, activism is no more uh, marching on the street. Yes, it is important. It brought the, it did brought highlights and it brought the attention of the world. I think. Um, like you mentioned, uh, yeah, we have greater Thunberg, and I also like greater Thunberg because she also left the gap since last year or so, giving space for other people because she was too much uh, uh, given the, um, what he called um, uh, attention, mm -hmm. which means mm -hmm. that many others lost their attention. So I think uh, nowadays, everybody wants to be a greater. And that's why they forget what they're really looking for. And uh, attending an event or conferences is not the priority. I mean, for me, it took two or three uh, big summits to understand what's going on because there wasn't any resources to learn. Now there are a lot of resources and documents and videos or experience sharing in your workshops given. I think you should start with there and then with the great knowledge you attend and bring that knowledge back to your community or your school or university or your clubs or your environmental or your association or organization. And this has to be, you know, work in a decentralized way, you know, not just going there and then you keep going and learn, doing nothing. Rather than, yeah. you know, it should be a learning opportunity for you to go. And, you know, it's not easy to attend and come back. It can involve calls, badge, travel. So when you go, you're, you are that representative of your community or your region mm -hmm. or your country. So what you should do is you, you, you need to be an advocate for them. So you, you go with the big bag of wealth you have of your country and you share there with your other activists, advocates, well, researchers, policy makers, UN agencies to tell what's happening. I mean, at the moment, uh, um, myself, I don't see a lot of people doing that. Now Now it becomes a most like, uh, yeah, I need to attend an event. Like I used to ask, like, hey, what do you do back home? I'm mm -hmm. just a student. I'm into climate, but I, I need to attend the conference. I mm -hmm. said, first thing you should do is join any club or organization, see what you can contribute there. Then think of doing something high. But yes, uh, the whole social media uh, thing is actually uh, diverting you know, young people's real attention to be a real change maker on the ground rather than influencing. Because, I mean, I am not against the influences of the global north because it works sometimes there. We are in a region where influence means nothing to the community. Mm -hmm. So it is important that you don't replicate things which doesn't work in our part of the world. Uh, the, the biggest uh, um, impact you can do is to showcase your community by doing it. Uh, establishing an organization, working through that, empowering youth in your country or region. This is when the community realizes your importance. Governments see you as a, a doer on the uh, in, on their country, and you're somebody who supports the national visions or etc. Unlike I, what I see the trend in the, this part of the world, uh, thanks to our global north friend, everybody wants to be a social media activist. Mm. I see what you do on ground. Yeah, I'm an influencer. I said, who you influence? <laughs> Uh, does the even many of the country's government don't even have a social media handle? So who are you influencing? And um, I'm sorry to say, the, many of our countries doesn't have a democratic elected governments. So who are you influencing? Mm -hmm. You don't have a voting system, uh, so you cannot influence your MPs or your uh, Democrats or Republicans or your country. There isn't anyone. So here, 
the doers makes the biggest noise. So I always used to say to young people from our part of the world, because we have a different uh, system of governance in most of the countries. So not to replicate an American or British or uh, Finnish or I don't know which countries system of youth engagement that works in their country, which is great. Now, Fridays for Future, which is a much celebrated movement by Greta, how many countries can do a march in our part mm-hmm. of the world? There's zero. People holding that numbers are illegal to do so. So people are like, why don't you do Nishad for Fridays for Future in Qatar? I said, by law, we cannot assemble such people in masses. That is against the law. Oh, we didn't know that. So this is a problem. Even the mm-hmm. youth climate movement really don't realize how the system in other countries work. How can I put my expertise mm-hmm. and support them? They think their way of doing is the right way. That's very imperialistic, uh, colonial mindset, which, uh, you know, I wasn't established because we were in the third world, uh, part of the world. So I think that comes from that fact that whatever they can't make is the ideal way to do forward. That's what I always used to tell guys, make friends from Global North, but don't replicate their project because that works in their country, which is which is great. I'm not anti to their great programs, their marchers, um, and doing stuff, but you don't have to jeopardize doing those things in your law because in your country it may be anti-law. So try to work with the project that influence or your government of, of whatever way of governance in your country, the way it can influence your community and how it can um, uh, develop a long-standing relationship between the community, government, and your organization. So this is what I always used to say, need not replicate, do projects within the realms of the law of your country, because here we are not fighting law. We are fighting to make sure that this uh, planet is livable for our generation in the coming years or decade. So for that, we need to collectively work. For that, you need to think and do it, not just to see something and just do it because they are doing it, I'm doing it. now. that doesn't work. So mm-hmm. my advice has been always that try to bring up with projects or initiative that works in your country. Maybe I say something that works in Qatar may not work in Saudi, 100% will not work in Bangladesh, or it doesn't work in London or in the UK or in the United States or in Spain. So try to bring that to make a sense for your government that makes them listen to you and to your community. They be part of this. And obviously you're targeting young people. So the target young people has to be part of your movement. So these are the main three areas I keep telling young people in our part of the region to, you know, implement, you know, not to get carried away with this uh, global north social media tent of activism, which is great in their part of the world, but our part of the world, it doesn't work. Mm. That's that's a really good point to make. I mean, a lot of young people, at least uh, in my community, tend to think that the only way to make real impact is, you know, work at the national, like international level at the top. But I mean, working, I I was curious, like working, you you work at both the local and the international level, which is really important to, you know, stay in touch with the people that are actually going to be affected. So, I mean, it's kind of like, we need both a top bottom and a bottom top, right? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, uh, Hedy, you just touched to that point. Yes, now everybody, every young people want to work at a very global conversation. I mean, for me, I would personally, I didn't end up in global um, at the first. I started at the local, learn mm-hmm. what's needed. And that's my knowledge. I, that's what I'm using at the international level now. But now people are not filling this gap and directly jumping to the top. So what they miss is the realities on the ground. Mm-hmm. That's why many of the youth, if you ask them, like, hey, I'm an activist from uh, Lebanon. Hey, good, good to know. How old are you? I'm 22 years old, great. So what are you doing? I'm here for advocating for climate action. Okay, what's happening in your country? Oh, my country, I don't know, but I want to have global conversations. See, that's the missing thing. Mm. If every kid start talking about international conversations, it doesn't happen without the local one. What, right, is, what, right. is, the, what, is, what is the global conversation when you talk, which is the highest one, which is the UN Climate Summit? What mm. is the UN Climate Summit talking about? It's the talk about the document they will come out of 194 countries. And who are these? You're part of that one country. So if you don't realize what's your country doing, or at least to study some of the country you are interested, like you want to study about US impacts or Saudi impacts, or you want to study of UK impact. So you have to have that knowledge. Just going there, advocating what you need, climate action doesn't work anymore. I'm of that generation where I used to say, um, so, sorry to say, it's still there. What do you need? Climate action, when do you need it now? This was quoted back in 2015, 16 Mm -hmm, era. mm -hmm. And still this is the chant happening with young people because sorry to say that means you haven't progressed. 
you haven't um, moved away from that sort of, you know, the change we wanted to look at from the youth point of or youth perspective. So the big, big fact is that everybody is tending to jump into the larger conversation without understanding local, but it's important. Some people might be really um, coming with a great academic background, you directly jump into international con um, uh, converse conversations or negotiations, which is quite, like you mentioned, there are they're required to be, but not that everybody will have to jump into there because, oh, that's the place where we get, get, get attention. Uh, people on the ground, nobody gets attention. See, that's what I'm talking about. That's why you don't find media covering those people because nobody gives attention to them. Everybody's on the global level and everybody mm -hmm. gets attention. So for the fact, this is actually uh, taking the youth moment in the wrong direction. And for me, for the youth from the region, which is already underrepresented, mm -hmm. many don't get up to that level because they have to fight the global north mm -hmm. youth. One or two makes it there. And they also have been be sidelined there because they want to have uh, stories of people who have 2 million followers, 250 follower, million followers mm -hmm. against somebody who doesn't have uh, you know, verified accounts. So th this, 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 this is also, you know, this is not just one side of the story. This is another side of the story. Like media don't cover because there are not many young people. And what our young people are doing, everybody wants to go at the top. They don't want to work at the bottom. So... In a way, the whole Global North movement is impacting how our young people think. They think everybody has to work at the global level. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a sad reality. And many do understand and they do watch like, hey, guys, this is not the exact that everybody need not have to be here. You need to work on the ground. But yeah, now climate change and climate advocacy has become too fancy, frankly speaking. So everybody thinks this is a very hippie thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, hippie thing is something very hippie to be an activist in your country. So um, I think um, this also undermined the good deal of work some of the great people mm -hmm. does. So this should be, you know, kept in mind that uh, because of you, there might be real people who may lose opportunity, uh, who are doing great things on ground. But if they are not, it is your duty to highlight their work. So that's how you help your community, your country, your regional countries in supporting one another. Yeah, no, thank you for that. That's really important to, to be aware of um, in, in working as young people. And I mean, just in general, to keep in mind, it's a good thing to be aware of. Um, I do also want to ask, I guess, um, I mean, in, in talking about like local initiatives, you've been a part of so many. Um, and I mean, I guess, like, do you have any particularly memorable or favorite moments or like anecdotes or projects that you can think of that you've, you know, experienced in your career? Well, um, uh, we have this program, which is very um, unique for our own way. Uh, which is called Green Ramadan. So, you know, in Ramadan, we have this Muslim month mm -hmm. of Ramadan very fast. So we hosted last year's, uh, oh, sorry, this year, the first of its kind, uh, Green Iftar. Uh, this is, means we had everything, uh, um, no plastic, plastic-free, mm -hmm. vegan food and stuff. We tried to make sure that uh, this uh, has a least impact on the environment. So we called the community to join and we were so happy to, it was so much celebrated and people were really happy and they said, we need a lot of this kind because we, we didn't do a speech there. We didn't do any presentation. People coming there realized that how this sort of things are very important from one point from the environment where like we were asking them, hey, don't bring anything plastic, don't bring your food, we're gonna get you all the food here. And we used all the furnitures which are made out of re recycled wood um, and all the leftover food. I mean, ideally there was no leftover food. We brought in the right quantity because we have registered numbers. Whatever leftover we were given to underprivileged people. Mm -hmm. And on top, we, we spoke, uh, it was a space for people to talk. We brought community there and they said, uh, it was nice to stay away from uh, some activists talking on Instagram against I talking to you and telling, right, hey, this yeah. is a great initiative. So it was a place for conversation around environment. And, and obviously for us, Ramadan is a very spiritual month and all. So it was sort of, you know, brought that sort of um, communities. Uh, um, uh, I don't know, they were aspiring to have something like that and we did it. And we were mm -hmm. so happy that it was so successful we will be doing a bigger number. We already had like 50 to 60 people. Oh, wow, Next yeah. year, we're going to have a bigger event. Uh, they really loved how we organized it and the team. Uh, you didn't, so they were happy that it was not a um, um, presentation, somebody talking about environment. Yeah, no, yeah. it was the setup. It was in a way that we were like, wow, 
I'm in a very green zone now. So <laughs> it was really, really, um, yeah, it yeah. was really charming. It was an evening and it was really, really touched. And uh, we were fortunate to have um, uh, Ambassador of Mexico, Ambassador of, uh, Deputy Ambassador of the UK, and Ambassador of Kazakhstan, all their family joined us. It was, oh so you, you understand, it was not, and they, they, they didn't give any formal speeches. They were also here to experience that stuff. And it was the first time, and even myself, I loved the concept of how uh, uh, you bring um, spirituality, environment, and community. Um, and like th this is what I ask people to do. Um, do it something that fits to your community and your country or in the context of what you want to do. Because uh, if you replicate something from the US or the UK or something, maybe that's, um, that's something fits to either their, their community, their, their culture and stuff. Uh, but when you bring the, that's something alien and two or five people participate mm -hmm. here, it may not be a great success. Well, you do some program that people ask next time, hey, I want to be involved. So, and it was for the community. It was not um, the, the people who are practicing uh, Islam. We brought everybody. Mm -hmm. So it became like a place of people of different diversity, different country, different religion, talking about environment. We thought even these telling, hey, you're here for environment talk now. They were here for a community iftar, mm -hmm. which is completely green. And we called it was the green iftar. And we will be uh, doing again next year, with more community participation. So it was really a, uh, something I never uh, saw. Uh, and we, we, we just tried it to see how it looks like. And it was really, really successful. And that was some, a unique project I like. But we have other projects too. But this is something I was really moved by because no environmental talk, no speaker, no stage. Everybody on the same land, space to eat, uh, made of wooden carvings. So it was uh, a really moving um, engagement and also brought attention that how much community uh, uh, needs such spaces to talk about mm -hmm. environment. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's really awesome. I mean, that's I'm just smiling the entire time because I mean, I've like, it's very unfortunately rare to have those community spaces to not have necessarily like you know like a top like a speaking at you you're not really able to engage your own personal experiences into it um but to have you know like just maybe like a dinner conversation over food and you know talking about other things other than the environment because I mean the environment is a part of other things as well it's not just you know strictly that it's a part of subtly everything so you yeah, know that's really awesome um and I, I do realize I want to respect your time so I guess to <laughs> To close off, um, could you, if if you could um, turn back time, um, you know, butterfly effects aside or whatever, um, <laughs> at, at any point, I guess, like at the start of whatever work you're doing now, um, what, what is some advice that you might give to the version of you who's just starting out? I, I mean, like I mentioned in my, my previous comments, um, I, I want to start people very, very small and very on the ground. I mean, this is what we are lacking as a youth movement now. Like you mentioned in our conversation today, everybody wants to work at the top. I mean, you don't really reach there. But of course, if you are having that extraordinary talent, which I believe many young people have, but why don't you use that to your community? Work at that local level. Yeah. Of course, you can work at the both level. But my, my request is to start very local join existing organization if it's already there or try to start your own if you feel that it's in the good space or good environment uh, for young people compared to any toxic environment you can start something of your own start that local and bring more community to join you let's try to bring that aspiration why you started and why you want the community to join and start that way and so because it gives you a part it's a, it's a part of learning and you know for me like fast five to six years was learning from a very small organization mm -hmm. to someone what we are today. And that learning experience makes you an expert. And uh, now today people are not ready to or be patient to be that expert. They're like, hey, I'm out of the university. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a specialist on climate now. So that doesn't come. I mean, even I am, I would say expert, but there are some areas that still I need knowledge, which I get from peers or our elders or our expertise on the um, subject. So you learn things. So there is nothing like you are an expert on day. I mean, at this age, I think not everybody can be really an expert, but you have um, a knowledge of walking through that. At least you can share that knowledge. So I think uh, my biggest um, um, uh, sort of uh, advice is that start very local. And the second would be try to do things that fits to your community, your country. Uh, need not replicate from anywhere, even your neighboring countries, unless you think that will fit for you. 
and be experimental. There is no one way to reach out to your community, reach out to your governments, reach out to the corporates in your country. And there is no, what you call, one success formula that can fit every country. Mm-hmm. So experiment, learn. We had projects which we failed miserably, but that was a learning lesson, right? Mm-hmm. Now, you know that in way you cannot proceed. So let's proceed this way. So start, I mean, this is how you do it. So start with the local and try to uh, imply projects that your country really need or your community need rather than just do it because your environmental association or organization, I'm just doing it because we have to do it because others are doing it now. See what is required in your community. If you're more like a, based on your country, if you're more farming country, look at your, how farmers need to support. If you're more working in a scientific field, look what is the gap in that scientific research they're doing. If you're a youth advocate and you see there is no much youth advocate, bring some programs for youth ambassadors in your country. So this is the way you engage. So do local, look at the requirements of the country, act based on that rather than just pulling it out something from elsewhere. So this is the two... Um, success formulas I have to tell, especially for the young people from the Arab region, to be frank, that if you try to do something at this level, I'm, I'm sure you will definitely reach that the, that level of the where you want to reach in many in 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 a couple of years time. Yeah, that's really great advice. And um, also for those listeners that want to you know keep up with the work that you're doing, where can they find you? I mean, you can fo- follow my social media account at uh, Nisha. Um, or my website um, also is um, taken care of uh, the latest things I've been doing. And also you can follow AYCMQA. Uh, all our projects at the moment are published on uh, our uh, social media accounts, which is at AYCMQA and www.aycmqatar.org. Uh, you will get the latest of uh, our programs, ongoing initiative, our events, which you can sometimes take part uh, virtually also. Some of the talk shows are also going uh, goes live. So, yeah, we are happy to uh, partner with everybody who are welcome to join us or support us. Uh, So, yeah, that's great. (laughs) That's awesome. All right. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi, for having me and um, um, giving an opportunity to talk about our initiative and uh, the regional issues as um, Arab youth facing. Um, We don't get many opportunities. So I try to make use of whatever opportunity I get to watch for our organization and other organizations like ours in the region. So thank you for having us here.